uh, when it comes to the whole uh, deception using of the matrix in order to trap us uh, spirited beings here uh, so whenever I uh, you know check out an ND store or whatever it uh, always seems as though they use deception and trickery because they don't actually have any you know force uh, ability on you so basically every ND story where people are be basically saying that they were forced to do something they always uh, show some kind of like fear a consent form in another way than verbal for example if you think of someone as a god being then you could give mental consent for that god being to control you or you know they have some kind of saying where it's like oh i had to do something and then later on they will say something like so i agreed you know like that's a pretty common thing what's your perspective on uh, that kind of stuff oh uh, like anything there's so many different ways you can show consent or agreement right um people tend to take it we're just putting it into our material world universe there's so many different ways you someone can say but you agreed you said yes you nodded your head you so on some i mean we've got we've got so many questions to ask it's not just it's not just the agreement necessarily within the incarnation we have now it's when did all of these incarnations start <clears throat> when did we first you might say drop into matter so what was the what in a sense was even the initial uh the initial agreement because the, here's a point that i think a lot of people tend to misinterpret and they still see they still see lives as continuous like in a timeline like there's a past life there's a present life and a future life and of course, from the standpoint of the finer realms, time doesn't exist in that way. There's no, there is no past and there is no future. It's all happening at the same time. So technically what's happening five years or 50 years or 500 years before is not actually affecting now like we think it is. It's one giant block. So even that is part of the conceptualized um, deception is um, there's, there's, and, and that may be it's why it's so difficult for anyone to remember what the agreement really was at the origin, because what was the origin point that threw us into this giant loop, right? So focusing on, I, I think just focusing on, like if somebody can remember their um, uh, pre-birth experiences, then, then you get a chance to uh, use that as a small window into what might have been the bigger uh, agreement that brought you into the whole thing in the first place if that makes sense yeah that makes a lot of sense it's um similar to the ideas that i've been talking about with uh, the vegan skeptic about uh, regaining our uh, essence you know and like past memories and everything so uh, i think that could actually give us a lot of insights by doing that um i do think that there is also the possibility of like the inception movie that there could be false memories or memories that are basically lies in a way. So, for example, say that you lived a previous life, you had a near-death experience or something in that life, and you were giving, you know, some kind of like information or whatnot, which is basically just a deception. And then later on, when you start regaining your memories, you might remember those deception and think that they're actually real. So I think even uh, when it comes to those things, uh, we should be careful about what we actually remember because there could be deceptions or falsehoods within those things. Yeah, uh, that's, at least from my own life, that's where uh, the recapitulation was so valuable was to see how much of what I thought was my past was not, the, the real experiences were not anything like my mind had categorized and told me that they were. So not only will the recapitulation help to see that a um, whole lot of things are changed within our world, I don't say change necessarily, but they are, they are, um, they're moved around and they are, they're not presented as they actually happened. And then we yeah, there's all sorts of things that happen that we don't remember at all. And once you start adding other past lives and things to it, it, it could be enormous. So, and I, I don't, I don't know how, how important it is actually at all personally to go digging into your past lives. Like you find out that you died in a horse accident in the 1840s. What good is that going to do you really? Um, 
you know, well, that'll explain why I, when I'm on a horse that I get, so what, you know, the, the goal of all of this is not to, is not to improve your material life. Your goal is to find the truth. So, uh, if somebody wants to do that, if that's how they want to put their energy and their focus, fine, but I'm not sure, even if you regain a whole bunch of past life memories, I'm not really sure what that's really going to do for, I would think if you could, if you could regain memories before you were in a physical body, if you could regain memories of your consciousness in finer realities, other realities, you know, I think that could have value just just finding more, more, uh, more, more mess in the material world of your lives. I'm not really sure how much that's going to really help you uh, anyway. Yeah, I, I tend to agree that uh, if uh, memories are going to help us, it would probably be the past experience on earth, basically. Uh, any like um, death states or why? whatever could be very important. Like, but what? Yeah, but why? Basically, just as an why, indication. Why would, why would another experience on Earth help you? No, I, I don't mean on Earth, but like yeah, uh, outside oh, of Earth. Yeah. Yeah. I get <laughs> on the other planes. Yeah. Exactly. So, so yeah, that's, that's, um, but that's so hard. Like you say, um, we have enough, we have enough trouble remembering our dreams, remembering our pre incarnation moments are um, a lot of work. Oh, yeah. I can imagine that. And like I said, you know, there could be a lot of deception in it as well. Yeah. It's, uh, I think when it that's, comes... That's, I think, that that's where, I'm sorry, that's where I think it's one really good thing to listen to some of the near-death experiences um, that people are sharing because we can hear, even though they don't notice it themselves, they don't necessarily notice the deception. They, they kind of gloss, they, they mention it, and they gloss right over into something much nicer. But we can hear what's in there we can hear the deception in the story and that helps us i think just get a better uh a better viewpoint of what we're potentially walking into because the more prepared like anything the more prepared you are the better chance you're going to have to to come out the way you want to come out of it right um if you if you know that there's a hurricane coming you can prepare your house to withstand the hurricane if you don't know it's coming you're just going to have to wing it and i don't know if i don't know if being in the in the uh in the um after death realm is a good place to be winging it <laughs> no probably not <laughs> yeah i think having a good plan of what you're actually intending to do once you pass over is probably a very good idea to like have a clear oriented goal so you're not just looking around trying to figure out how reality works or something it's um uh, I, I assume you've seen my escape guide, right? I've, I've seen, I'm sorry? If you've seen my escape guide on YouTube. Yes. Yeah. So basically that's like a uh, minimum required knowledge video kind of to like yeah, escape the matrix in my viewpoint with a lot of other information that you could also learn as well. So um, from my perspective, a lot of the afterlife events are basically like pure distraction based so when it comes down to it basically if you just ignore most of those things you know like block it all off you're going to be way better off than trying to investigate by viewing things from the matrix point of view it's um i mean you talked about the and it's a really good name by the way for your book exiting uh, the cave it's um so basically, if we consider, you know, the astral realms, the after death realms, all of that stuff as, you know, different layers within the cave, it's uh, as long as we're looking at the stuff that the matrix is presenting to us, we're never really going to be likely to find a way out of the matrix. So when I hear someone talks about, for example, using portals to exit the matrix, I consider that to be a very, very like bad idea because a portal, you know, assumes 3D space, it is a physical or some kind of like manifestation, but it's still within the matrix realm. And so in order to even observe that uh, portal within the matrix realm, you're giving mental consent to even perceive, perceive things within the matrix realm, which means you're interacting with it in a way, which is why in my escape guide, you know, I talk about the stealth uh, shield, you know, like, yeah, 
forever uh mark from forever <clears throat> forever consciousness research channel he talks about you know being shielded it's basically the same thing uh, i think that's a very good uh like a pathway basically because uh if you're interacting with the matrix you're giving consent forms and even a small little consent form about observing things is going to give the matrix permission to basically affect you in different ways it could show you things which could affect your you know emotional states which is something you talk about in your book how we basically have to control ourselves so that uh, uh, i don't remember what you call it but basically not allow it to you know affect us in any kind of way using our emotional states Well, again, the, the, the again, and, and like I say to everyone at all times, you know, I, I don't know for sure what's going to happen when when we die. I don't know for sure how this um, reality was created. I've just got thesis and ideas and research that I think are on the right path, but I don't want anyone to think I've got specific answers or anyone has specific answers. It's really important to just take information in, take uh, take suggestions in and um, and go through it for yourself you have to you have to find this information and find answers for yourself so i just want to make sure you, everyone hears that again if, if someone hasn't heard me before um one of the great challenges for sure that these near-death experiences remind us that we're going to face is how easy it is for us to just move into the experience the same as when we have a dream like like um what you just said on one sense, it, 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 it's sort of good, but it's also if you can't, if you can't become extremely lucid, like if you have a dream at night <clears throat> and instantaneously you're just, you're moving along in the dream state and you're just, you know, the car comes and picks you up. So you get in the car and you wonder where you're going. And I mean, you're, you're already gone. You're not, you're not aware that you're in a dream. And so I think the first step is learning how to be aware that you're in the, in the after death realm so that you can actually begin to um, put forth if you have a plan or a strategy if 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 you can't it, it's like if the if the reality if the reality tricks you instantaneously just like when we have a dream and the reality tricks you instantaneously there and you're automatically in it the preparation won't do you much good so for me that would be a big part of the preparation is is that you are able to you have such awareness in your crossing over point that you can recognize immediately what you're in. So that's why I suggest to people to practice some lucid dreaming so that uh, you can start to get used to constantly asking, what reality am I in? How is this reality created? You know, it's what what level of dream am I in? Am I dead? Am I alive? Am I, because if, if you if you miss that step, you, I think you're the majority of people then just get that's the word we'll just get pushed along with whatever like you say the the manufactured scenario is going to be so that that's a really big challenge is how to that's prep almost preparation well yes there's preparation for the okay i'm just going to stop talking i'll let you talk but that's um you know there's so many pieces to just that information that then you can take it five steps this way and five steps that way but uh, really being being able to be aware of what's going on that's step one i think if you miss that the the rest of it will be very hard to to undertake yeah i think that's a really good point it's um if we're not aware that we're dying you know and we enter the other side and we could just be pulled along without even recognizing what yeah. we're doing it's uh if you if you die in your sleep and you think you're dreaming that's not really a good idea or a good situation to be in so yeah, I do think it's a very there, good like, idea. There's a good practice. question. That's actually a really good question, right? Like, is there a difference like somebody who gets killed being run over by a bus and somebody who just dies in their sleep and just, you know, most people like to think, oh, die, I'd like to die in my sleep like that. That seems like a nice way to go. But yeah, if you're in, if you're in the dream state, what, if you're actually in, and we know how, how, um, how all consuming dreams can be and if we are in a, in an all consuming dream when our physical body ends and dies how aware are we going to be of the change point so it's also interesting to even ask that question is <laughs> if we're thinking about death well, what's a, what is a good way to die in order to get the end result we're looking for so it's really strange to ask a question like that but i think it's something we should all think about like 
you know, does dying, is dying in bed different than, yeah, dying, being hit by a bus or having a heart attack on the street or, you know, um, uh, it's, a, I don't know. Do you have a thought on that? Do you have, have you ever thought of there could be a difference? Yeah, I actually think there's a good chance that there is. If I imagine someone that doesn't know about the soul trap and they're having a good dream or something and they die during that dream, yeah. uh, the chance of them figuring anything out at all is going to be very low because they're probably going to think they're dreaming because the last thing they remember is going to sleep. And then some figure shows up and convinces them to do something and it's going to be like, sure, why not? Mm. That sounds funny. It's uh, mm. His discernment isn't going to be as high as if he dies consciously. Right. Yeah, it's just something I you know often haven't thought about until just like right now. I um I had a dream a while ago where uh, I encountered a matrix being, and I was uh, basically yeah. communicating with it. And during my dream, I said the words "because I don't trust you," which I thought was a really good indication that my mental state was in the right direction. Because that basically means mm. that even if I would die during a sleep uh, state, basically, and not be aware that I actually died, I would still be rejecting whatever they tried to present to me. So I wouldn't be tricked, you know, by thinking it's just a dream. I hope that's true. Um, it's, 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 again, it's so challenging because we really don't know what it's going to be like. And we are using, we are using our physical material experience which of course is nothing but a projection right is nothing but a holographic interaction of of mind and and energetic waves and we're sort of we're trying to place <clears throat> we're trying to place how we have this experience as to how we're going to have that experience and it's so it, it is really difficult it's um it's uh at first, when you begin to deal with the stuff, and when I was first, you know, because now I, I finished writing the book, I guess, in September, I guess, when the book was finished. And now I've kind of, I'm beginning the research on going deeper now. I'm beginning. That was kind of like the, how I say, it's kind of like the main, the first, uh, the starter in, in food. And now I'm starting to work on the main course. And now as I'm starting to really dig into other stuff, I'm seeing there's a lot of stuff I wrote in Exit the Cave or was thinking about in Exit the Cave that is probably flawed thinking that's actual or very simplistic thinking. It sounds good from the standpoint of, of an overview, okay? But how much of that now am I going to take into the, into the actual structure of this is the movement forward. This is this is the actual preparation point. So it's also interesting to see that I think you have to go through stages with this process. You have to, you know, I've had 25 years on and off of doing all sorts of exercises and practices and, and having been lucky enough to have conversations with really clear uh, people who still hold a lot of ancient wisdom. And, um, and I'm still working hard to figure things out so it's it it's a long it's a long journey of work particularly with someone who doesn't and i think there are people who have the keys i actually think there are a few people who know the whole still know the whole story know exactly what to do like know exactly what to do as you're going into death know, know exactly what you've done before that know exactly what to do after they just they're just, I think, remaining, choosing to remain silent for, um, for certain reasons. And, um, and it's a lot of work to really go from, this is a good idea to, I know, you know, and that's, that's, that's the difference. It's from a good idea to no, now I know, I know this is exactly what it's going to be like. This is exactly what's probably going to happen. I, and I, I, I know the methodology I'm going to take going into it. And um, at least I can say for myself, even after all this work, I'm still in the, uh, I'm still working to put the entire package of understanding together. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, you can see all kinds of, you know, people developing over the years as they learn more and more. It's, uh, I mean, I don't have the exact same perspective I have now as when I first started learning about the soul trap. It's uh and I've only known for the about the soul trap for about you know one and a half year, so I'm still pretty new at it. 
I'm still learning. So, I mean, 30 years from now, who knows? Yeah, you know, and it's, and there's, again, there, there's so many, I mean, there's things I was doing 25 years ago, practices and, and exercises and things I was, that didn't seem it was going to have, that was going to lead to this part of it, but it's all, it's, it's a big giant soup of understanding. And um, because when I first began this, when I first began writing my Egypt book and was working on the ancient Egyptian stuff, I was spending a lot of time testing reality. That was, in a sense, I was testing the physical matrix. I was testing the, I was testing the solidity of it. I was testing, um, you know, how solid and real was this place. And so I spent about two years of those first four or five years of work. Two years was just spent testing reality. And of course it failed miserably. Um, reality just turned out to be extremely transparent and extremely um, uh, changeable, uh, almost at will. And and that's actually, it is actually part of the stuff we're talking about now. And it is part of exiting the cave. You you have to, on one level, you have to get, you have to get an understanding of the cave and how it works. But the trick is, or the way you people tend to get tricked is everything keeps getting you to focus on, to go deeper, learn more, focus more, learn how to do more. It's like an endless an endless exploration of the cave as opposed to exploring the cave to the point that you need to explore it at and then say, okay, I got, I, I got this. I got what I need about this place. I, I know I don't have it all figured out, but I don't have to. I've got enough of it figured out that I can turn to the exit and start understanding, okay, now I can focus on the exit. So, and for everybody, that's a little different. Some people might need a few months or years. Other people might need 10 or 20 years. Maybe I did. Maybe I needed 20 years of exploring the cave. I don't know. But I know there are people that have been doing this for 30 or 40 years that I don't know if they're ever going to stop. So like everything, a really important part of the process is knowing when is it time to stop and when is it time to focus on something else? That That's a great, that's actually a powerful moment to be able to, with awareness, be able to say, I know enough of what I need to know in this particular area. Now I'm going to move on. It's, it's a powerful thing, but you'll notice... Um, if you notice, if you look around, you notice not many people do that. Not many people know when it's time to stop. Yeah, I would agree on that. It's um, something I noticed is that the Matrix like to make uh, rabbit holes, which basically don't actually lead anywhere. So you'll study some yep. conspiracy or something and it just goes on and on and on and deeper and deeper. And and like at the end of it, it didn't actually help you in any, any kind of way at all, you know? No. So. No. <laughs> <laughs> exactly that's that's another of those yeah those things uh and, and you kind of have to do it you have to figure that out for yourself because as long as you're still uh as long as you still think there's more to study there's more to learn there's more to understand it's yeah it's it's the 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 matrix has you and i mean I, I'm, I'm saying that from my own experience right i'm saying that from my own times where I just spent way too long studying one specific subject and um, and I, I give a good a really good example like a, a power of them so I studied along with all this other stuff I studied the ancient world for eight or ten years like all through Egypt all through Mexico all through stone sites in Europe through various and when I came out of it, and I thought I'd, I, I, in one sense, I'd learned a lot of information, but how much of that can I take with me right now? Um, maybe 10% of it, you know, 90% of it is either up for question. I don't agree with anything, what I believed about that anymore, or it's just, I don't see it necessarily as all that valuable. So when we think about all of the all of the places we put our effort into, and I don't just mean in these kind of searches, I mean like anything, whether it be careers, whether it be uh, things we do, hobbies, ways we spend our time. If we, if we could look back on our life at the amount of time and energy we put into things that actually had no value whatsoever to anything, I'm sure we would want to do things very, very differently. And you can't change that, but you can start saying, okay, where do I want to put my time now? I've got I've got limited amount of time and given the world we're, we're living in right now, we have no idea how much time we have before this whole thing just in a sense, you know, explodes completely on us. So we have to kind of say, what's the best use of my time? And then have enough 
mm, not willpower, what's the word I'm looking for, have enough inner inner fortitude to make sure that the things we've now deemed to be important that we put that time into. And again, it, these are things that sound simple, right? I've talked for a long time about commitment. I talk about courage. I talk about, uh, you know, again, like this, using your time. And it, it's they're simple. You know, commitment is simple. Commitment is one of those, the simplest things you can put forth in. But how many people actually hold on to their commitments? Almost none. So sometimes the most important stuff is actually the easiest, but tends to be the most difficult to do because we haven't been taught how to do the most simple things. Yeah, I agree with that. It's um, well, when it comes to the whole escaping the soul trap ideas, I think some of the core things that we should really work on is our own like personal development as a being. So like not having any you know fear or the ability for someone to control you emotionally. So like stoicism in a way is like very important. It's um, the ability to basically leave everything behind. It's um, even just the idea of uh, maybe you could never have a physical experience again after you leave the matrix, which could technically be possible. It's uh, probably not the case, but it is possible. And if you're unable to deal with such an idea, then like that might actually drag you back into it. It's like, yeah, the old idea of uh, being addicted to experience the sensory input. Yeah, right. Um, what's that? What's there's a quote in one of the uh, I, I can't remember if it's a New Testament or if it's a Gnostic Gospels or, but it's the idea that if you can't, you have to lose your life in order first to find it, right? This idea. And that means as long as you're tied in any way to this realm, which of course is, it's false, it's fake. It's um, it's also another challenging thing for you, you. You will never find the spiritual in the material world. Once you, if you've actually ever find it, if you actually ever find truth, then you can see truth in a sense minorly mirrored in the material world it's not major it's, it's it's very small little pieces of it then you can find it but until you've until you like you say until you've actually left you might say until you've actually disconnected from the place completely um you, this place will will have in some way your attention trapped so um i would pretty much agree with what you said it's it's just um how to go about teaching someone or teaching uh, teaching yourself how to go about teaching yourself to step away from the material when if you're thirsty you have to drink if you're hungry you have to eat if you need to keep breathing you need to you know there's so many things that have to be done in the material from the from the body suit from the heavy the heavy thing that we're wearing here how do how does one taper their consciousness taper their awareness to allow the form to do what the form does to, in a sense, act like an actor in a movie while all the time have a, a, the majority of the attention not here. And, and it's a, it's a very subtle thing. And, and something, um, it's something that some of the books of Carlos Castaneda were hinting to, they were hinting of ways to begin preparing your, your perception to kind of, in a sense, be standing in two worlds at the same time. And it's, it's it's also um it's also a lot of work um it's also it's not something that will happen overnight it's something you have to determine you have to have the intention that that's something you want to attempt to see what would happen by doing it and then it's to go through the practices of actually preparing your body mind form to handle that so i'm sorry we're making this making this sound really difficult but in some ways i mean this is I mean, this is not like um, we have we have you know we fall is fallen into matter, and it's like think of it as falling into a giant vat of molasses, that really thick, heavy, dark liquid, and to extricate yourself or or in quicksand. That's another way of looking. You're in quicksand. You know, you're, you're sinking, but really slowly. But you are sinking. It's got a hold of you. And there's a certain way to get out of quicksand. So maybe this is a really good analogy. There's a certain way you get out of quicksand. It's not the way people think, right? Normally, if someone goes into quicksand, they'll start trying to drag themselves out, and you'll just push yourself in further. You actually have to lay down in the quicksand and, like, swim. You actually, like, you almost, like, float yourself out of quicksand. It's the complete opposite of what people would think. So if we use quicksand as our analogy, uh, we escape 
we escape in sort of the opposite way we think we would escape from this place. Yeah, um, on the note of that, I see a lot of um, anger with people when it comes to the soul trap. You know, like, uh, once I leave, I'm going to destroy the Matrix kind of talk. And I think that's that's a huge attachment, you know. it's uh, That's uh, getting yourself stuck in the quicksand, you know. And, like, uh, lying down on the quicksand is kind of like... Uh, um, it's a way of detaching from the matrix I would, you know, translate that into. So basically, instead of fighting the quicksand, you know, you basically reject it. And that's like the way you, uh, you would, I would imagine that is uh, the appropriate mm -hmm. way to actually leave this matrix. Because um, so from all that we can see, mm -hmm. basically, the matrix doesn't have any power over you. So the only way for it to actually trap you is basically for you to trap yourself. So by basically preparing mentally and, you know, having a good exit plan, you know, on top of that, you should be pretty, you know, likely to get out of here, basically. It's, um, I, um, I had a talk with uh, some people on my Discord where I mentioned the idea that uh, if, um, if you're not able to both uh, receive and reject emotions, you know, stimuli on will, then that is a very bad thing when you leave this place because, uh, Say that uh, everyone faces the light, uh, the love bomb, and it doesn't matter if you put up a stealth shield, you know, to block it out, it's going to hit you anyway. And you do not mm -hmm. have the ability to reject a good feeling, then how likely are you to actually escape the matrix? And another thing is that uh, a lot of people will uh, go the monk way, where it's like, uh, oh, uh, no feelings at all, you know, like, uh, I don't eat anything sweet, you know, because I'm a fucking man mode, you know, or something like that. Yeah. And then it's like, okay, well, uh, now you have no good emotions or anything, and then you face the light, and it's the, you know, the, the most loving, awesome feeling ever. It's like, how likely are you to be able to reject that kind of thing when you've been starved out of uh, good emotions and stimuli? And the same thing, it's like, uh, if you only live for stimuli, so, like, if you go the hedonist way, to be like, yeah, oh, this life doesn't matter, so I should just uh, grab as much uh, pleasure as I can, then you don't build up the resistance to be able to reject something. So I think mm -hmm. the mental practice, removing as much addiction kind of things as possible, clearing out mm -hmm. your mentality so that you don't have things that you regret. It's like the, the acceptance of not... Uh, like regretting things and all that kind of stuff uh, removing attachments before you go so that nothing can really hold you down anymore what you just said is that actually people should go back and listen to that like two minutes that was really good or whatever that was minute and a half um, that's that's a pretty good overview of a lot of this situation it's our attachment to the matter and it's how are we, how do we deal with that attachment and like you say some some sink into it further some decide i'm going to fully enjoy it some decide they're going to reject it completely and again there's this um there's there's like an acceptance without accepting if that makes sense you you uh i still like i still like the metaphor of being an actor in a, being an actor in a movie but uh, knowing you're an actor, right? That's, that's I think, one of the most important elements of it is that you're not rejecting the physical experience. You're not, re you're not, you're not, like you say, you're not rejecting emotions. You're not reject rejecting experiences. You're not, but you're not, um, you're not identifying in any way with what's going on as it being personal. You're just, you're just an actor in a movie and these things are going on and you have a role that you're, or maybe not a role. I don't want it to make people think like I would suggest like there's a script and you have to follow a script. I used to say that, but it's not really, it's more like just, there's a, uh, think of it like as an improv performance and, and you are, you have a, you have a character role in the improv and all that matters is you're just holding on to your, you have to hold on to your character, no matter what the improv throws up at you. Uh, with the idea that afterwards, when, when the show ends, you're not going to sit there and, and determine your self-worth based on the the overall what happened in the improv. It's just, you just you can just know, I did my role, followed what I was supposed to do, okay, and that's it, and you kind of leave it behind. So 
Yeah, I, I think what you were saying there is very, very valid information. It's the it's the attachment we're putting to the matter and the experience. And because, yeah, if that's also a really good comment you made. If somebody is not and not prepared to handle emotion at all, if they have rejected emotion, and then the in the astral after death realm, it's all emotion, right? It is it is emotion plus. So how are you ready to handle and navigate emotions that you haven't been able to navigate and handle on a much simpler level? Yeah, it's going to be like the old Vulcan story where someone isn't uh, handling, you know, emotions at all. And once they get them, they freak the fuck out and uh, become like a lunatic, basically. Yep. Uh, This is... I would have to agree with all of that. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) I I was going to mention also uh, on the topic of this... um, so I had a discussion uh, some time ago where basically I mentioned the idea that uh, you should be okay with the possibility that you might have been a terrible person in the past. So say that you die and you start doing some kind of mantra, higher clarity, you know, like uh, past memories or mm-hmm. something like that. Uh, and then you start remembering past lives and you recognize that you were an evil soldier, you know, you did a bunch of horrible shit. And you have, you know, a thousand lifetimes of doing horrible stuff. And it's basically only recently that you stopped being an asshole. And you start feeling like a really terrible person. And now you have these emotions about do-overs, you know, and I don't deserve to leave this place. I'm terrible. So I think it's very important not only that you're able to control stimuli and like be able to accept and reject that will, but also the ability to basically forgive yourself for whatever you may and may not have done. So that you're not uh, backstabbed by your own past, basically. Yes, I think there's a there's a bit of a two edged sword. I mean, one, it's seeing that choices were made in the material world, and obviously there are choices that are. Um, you know, once once somebody realizes that souls. Or we'll call them divine sparks, right? Divine sparks are trapped in matter, and that's just not in human form. I think there's divine souls that are trapped as well in, in animals, in plants, in rocks, and everything. You gain a once you understand that there there's a there's an empathy that starts to come towards all of existence, in that not that you're now wanting to necessarily, um, um, you know. Uh, love it unconditionally or something but you just appreciate the struggle that everything's going through and so you need you don't need to add struggle to anything else you just realize things have enough problems i don't need to add extra problems so when we're looking when i think when you look back and see i mean of course you're going to see a lot of stuff that's been done to us in previous lives but the things we've done ourselves or things you've done in this particular life before you've started to shake your head loose um It'll come from it'll come from the realization that you didn't you didn't know that a you are you are in a trap and that every every or most everything else not most a lot of what else you see around you is also in such a trap. So it's 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 an opportunity to re understand your empathy and uh, and understand uh, ignorance because that's really what it was. It was it was when you act this way you act out of ignorance, right? The Cathars were very the Cathars had certain ways of living with the natural world that were built on their understanding of what this reality was in a sense to not add any more physical suffering on anything else in in creation um that being said we have to remember that the true nature of us our true divine spark is whole or we're we're needing to remake it whole again let's put it that way it's it's it, it is its end goal is completion its end goal is totality its end goal is everything and so we have to we have to we have to hold true to where you where you want to go not where you've been and so i think it's also good to have looked into what what you've just said to okay what if this comes up in a past life like you say this this life gets thrown on your face and you can't hide from it you can't turn from it, it gets it gets blasted in sense at you uh, how are you going to be ready to internally handle that? And I think a big a big part of it is, uh, like anything, what's your focus of where do you want to go? 
not so much the focus of where you've been. You have to acknowledge where you've been and you have to, you don't want to hide from it. You don't want to deny it. But if your focus isn't on where you want to go, you're not going to get there. So like anything, you know, um, uh, I've been a with a hockey coach for a lot of years and you have to go over what your team's not done well. But if all you're focusing is on, on the mistakes you've made in the last week or so and not focus on what you want to do in the next game, you're just going to get mistake after mistake after mistake because that's all you're focusing on. If the focus is simply on here's where we've been, here's the corrections we need to make, and we're going forward with the corrections, we're going forward with, we're going forward with where we want to be, not where we've been, that gives that gives you the advantage of walking the path you want to walk. I think even in even though we're going to be in an astral after death state, there's still in a sense a pathway you might say. There's still or uh, it makes me sound material. There's still a direction, right? There's still a there, yeah, that's a good. There's still a direction that you're going to be moving into, and that direction is being in a sense built here. And I think if you don't have that direction in place that's where a lot of the things you've been talked about will be easy to be steered to the side but if you if you know where you if you know what your end result is and your intention is to reach the is to reach the goal that you've set out for yourself the the chances of failing go down less and less and less but if anything behind you can turn that's the um, the biblical story uh, Cain and Abel or Cain and Abel where the the wife is no Lot where Lot's wife is turned into a pillar of salt and he's not supposed to turn around and look. And that's kind of what it is. When you're, when you're going forward, don't look back. You, you kind of can't look back at where you've been. You've got to look forward at, at the totality that is your end result. Yeah, that's a great way to explain it. It's, um, I have a saying that I like to use, which is uh, understanding over judgment, which is kind of a, a mental setting to place myself in. Uh, so like yeah. I can uh, you know use discernment which is different from judgment because judgment has this uh, negative quotation to it so I can understand if someone's doing something bad but I won't be judging about it rather I will be understanding about it you know and try to help someone and um, hmm. if I have that kind of mentality about other people I will carry that over to myself so if I do experience a memory of being a complete fucking asshole then basically I would be able to use understanding about it rather than judgment. So I think that's a pretty good way. You should basically make yourself the kind of person who will have a better chance of making it out of here before you die. Yeah. Of course, a few people, some, I, some can do it before you die. And I want to make sure that some know that they're, you don't have to wait till death. It can be done directly from a, from the material world, from a physical body. I don't have proof of that 100%, but I, I feel very confident, uh, given that I, I do think it's possible. Whole cultures, the Maya, the, the Anasazi, maybe a few others, just literally as a group, just left. And um, it, it, But it's, it'd be a, it would certainly be a different pathway, a different way of doing it. And, it, and we have... Uh, we know there's a transition point of death. We know we've been learning of certain things that will happen there. We, we, we're we gaining, like, thankfully, one nice thing about the internet is we've gained a, no a lot of knowledge in these areas that kind of didn't, wasn't available to us 20 or 30 years ago. We would have had to track down 30 people in our city who had near-death experiences and hope they would talk to us and figure out what they, I mean, this, th there's just so much material available and that gives us such a great advantage. So we have this advantage point of the death transition, but I don't want someone to think that it is possible to be done like, you know, now, like right now it could, it could happen. Um, and it's made me wonder about, I've said this a few times, the, um, the uh, phenomenon of spontaneous human combustion, which used to fascinate me even as a kid, when I would read, when I pump into a book, uh, it's like what actually happened when somebody just spontaneously catches fire? What what is the energy within them? Because it, it, it they they burn from with they burn from within out. That's something that's really interesting. It's like it's like the fire is within them and just and just takes over. You know, burns out their body. And I wonder if it's something that somehow one way or another they they came to an exit point and the exit doing it while in a physical form 
in a sense, short circuits the physical form, literally just just like you, you've plugged your socket, you've plugged your plug into a, into a different socket. And so you just, you fry the, you fry the whole system. And I wonder if that's maybe what happened. So I would be very, I would be curious if possible to look back at experiences. I don't know if anyone's ever done this before. I would love to find out some of the research, the people who've had spontaneous uh, combustion experiences to look at like their life, the, like the three or four months beforehand, what were they doing? What were they reading about? What were they thinking about? Was their life seemingly the same as it always been? Have they been really thinking about things? Have they been questioning things? Have they been reading particular kinds of books? Have they been doing things differently that was putting them in a completely different mindset? I would be really, really curious to know more of the mental state, not just like the days before it happened, like literally the months before, just in case that's some sort of clue as to the possibilities of doing it while still in the body. Now, if we talk about say the Maya or the Anasazi, for example, well, we don't we don't have bodies. It's one of the one of the problems we have with these cultures, right? They the the archaeologists are, I guess I guess they're technically not arch they're anthropologists, I guess, who work those uh whatever. Anyway, um is that they know they have these huge civilizations, massive, massive amounts of people, millions of people in these civilizations, and then they're just they're empty. They're just gone. And they can't explain it because they can't find graves. They can't find bodies. They, and they come up with all sorts of very lame excuses to try to explain why there were a whole bunch of people. And then all of a sudden there weren't any more, but without the bodies. And um, this is one of the only ones I can kind of think of is that they literally, uh, in a sense, left reality as, as, a, as a huge group. And... Um, but in their case, didn't or again, maybe they left physical remains of just ash. Of course, if it's if they if they had all spontaneously combusted well within the twelve hundred years or fifteen hundred years since that happened, of course there'll be nothing left of any of them. I, I, there might not even be skeletal remains. So it's interesting to think about. We're preparing for the after death state, but that doesn't mean the possibility couldn't literally just happen tomorrow. Couldn't literally happen like tomorrow. Something could say. Are you ready to go home? And if you say yes, maybe you're going home. I mean, it could be, it could happen just like that. So I think it's also we're preparing for the transition state of death because that's probably what we're going to experience. But we don't know. Something, some doorway might happen all of a sudden, like tomorrow. Are you ready for it to happen like without dying? That's another that's another reminder I like to throw out there to people. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of the Ascended Beings from the Stargate uh, series. So that's basically what they did, but less flames. So they just turned into like light beings. And that was after removing fear, guilt, and like attachment to the realm. So it's kind of like an Ascension uh, story as well with that uh, series. Maybe. I mean, again, now, of course, if they did, if they did an Ascension... Well, they're still in the matrix, right? They didn't really do anything. They just, that, in that case, you just left the material world for a finer world. And you and I, of course, we're talking about leaving the matrix. We're talking about being gone completely. And of course, we don't know if, if, for example, the Maya or the Anasazi did what you just said, then, okay, they got themselves out of this place, but did they trap themselves in, if, that, if that's all they did, did you, you know, what's the point of trapping yourself in just a different layer? Granted, it's, it's probably a nicer layer, but the problem with the nicer layers is it's even easier to be trapped. You know, when we're when we're having a nice dream, we're happy to dream. We only want to wake up when we're having a nightmare. So it's also one of the the gifts we have of the painful suffering of matter is that it's it's a wake up call of hey, this is a nightmare. So get out of this. And if 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 you know that's Anyone who's there are because there are some people, there are actually some people who've had really good lives here. They've had good parents. They were cared for. They were loved. They had opportunities and doors open to them, and you know never had to join secret organizations to do that. They literally just—it's like literally they had like a good life. They're not thinking about the stuff we're talking about. They're not thinking about how to get out of the matrix and return home because it's been okay 
in some way, if you are coming to listen to what we're talking about here and are, in a sense, taking it somewhat as a possibility in your life, then obviously there's been difficulty. You've had challenge. You've had tragedy. You've had you've had t really tough times because if you haven't had that in your life, there's not going to be that impetus to say, then I want to be done with it. There will always be, there will always be a way of somehow being a part of it, fixing it, enjoying it, liking it, uh, redoing it, having more to do here. So I know that a lot of people will be dealing with past trauma and past tragedy and past difficulty. Um, just like I have, we have to take those as like, not as something that was just obviously we wouldn't wish to go through those experiences and we don't wish others to have to go through them but we use them in such a way that we fuel our rocket with that energy to you might say to to make it where we want to go and knowing that if we didn't have those in our past we wouldn't be here talking about these experiences and listening to this kind of material now it's part it's part of the exit plan unfortunately is seeing the suffering of the realm if you don't know this place is suffering you don't want to leave it yeah that reminds me of uh the mythology of the lord of the rings uh, series where basically it's not the good guys that destroy the ring in the end it's the evil ring that destroys itself using the suffering that it causes others mm. it's a it's a pretty common uh, mythology thing in uh, fiction where basically evil destroys yeah. itself or you might say because it's it's not being uh all, all evil is is something that's not life well not even life supporting it's a bad word it's just not it's not totality it's not completeness and so because completeness doesn't absolute does can't destroy itself because there's nothing there to destroy and there's no one to do the destroying right this this idea of total unity but, but as i mentioned as well something i got caught in myself and a lot of people get caught in is Re feeling like you've reached a place of unity, reached a place of absolute, and thinking this is what this is what it's all about. I've I've reached a certain height, and you have actually you've reached. But what like in my case anyway, I reached what would what I would consider to be the mirror of absolute totality within the matrix. So everything in the matrix is a mirror of everything else. So there's also a mirror of absolute totality. So generally, when someone is presenting that they've reached unity or totality or absolute they've reached the copy that's in the matrix which makes it tainted which makes it not actually true and then it's easy to get distorted because anything anything we hook onto in the matrix is a distortion so the the hook we have to it will always create distortion and um so it's all the the, the level the levels of possible deception are so so many and the ones who tend to be leading the flock, pre pre presenting that they're leading the flock somewhere really good, tend to be just leading the flock uh, around in circles, you know, the dog chasing its own tail. And that's all that's really going on here. And there's very, very few, even though there's a lot of very intelligent people, a lot of wise people, very people who aren't necessarily deceiving anybody openly, they they truly believe their experience and they've read the books and they believe the books and they believe the famous teachers from a thousand years ago. And, and so they just, they feel they're in the same, they're not doing it purposely, but they're still just taking their sheep around and around in a circle. And, and it's, it's quite a thing because we have to do this a big part of this work. We have to do alone. We can share things for a while and, and it's good to have people you can share with and talk to and, um, understand where each of you are but it, it is a it is a solitary journey we have to come to our own understandings within we have to come to our own our own conclusions within and even if everyone else around us disagrees with us all we have to trust is ourselves. and that's i think that was something you were mentioning like about a half an hour ago which is part of the package which is uh learning to trust our deepest self not our mind not uh you know not voices in our head i mean trust the true self the deepest part of ourself to learn how to connect to it uh know what it is and when it gives us a message we trust it yeah it's um i mean i started my escape guide with you know a rant about sovereignty and thinking for yourself and like telling people that they shouldn't just take my word for it my word for it <laughs> 
So, I, I mean, yeah, it, it really is a sovereign yeah. path. It's uh, even just the fact that you're rejecting this uh, creation, this world, like that's sovereign as well, being able to resist emotions, impulses, you know, or stimuli that they might try to push on you. Basically, choosing everything about what your experience is going to be, like you're taking the direction that you want to go in. You're not going to let something else decide, you know, what your future as a being is going to be. Like that kind of attitude where you're basically the god of your own fate. Yeah, I can. Uh, yeah, I understand the idea, and uh, it's, it's. Yeah, it's quite. It's quite the thing once you've done. Um, like I say, I've I've walked into many a trap in my life, thinking I was, thinking I was opening a door that was giving me more freedom, and I was just finding another ch chain to put around myself. It was very interesting to see how that was done and particularly particularly when i would uh, then decide i'm going to let other people know that they should do what i'm doing because i've figured it out and so not only am i putting a chain around somebody else i'm tightening my own chain <laughs> right <laughs> and and i like to think now after uh 15 or 20 years from that that uh, my tone is much more soft now, and I, I'm not sure how much I know or I don't know. Uh, I'm working with all that within, um, but kind of, you know, like you, it's this idea of, but I don't want anyone to just follow blindly what I suggest, even all the exercises. Yeah, I talk a lot about recapitulation or gazing or a whole lot of other practices that I did for 10 or 15 years. That doesn't mean, you know, you should do them. They were just practices that were valuable to me and you can read some of my books or bump into things where I talk a little bit about it and talk about what I did and and what what I feel I got out of them to see if it's something you'd like to try even if you try it you may try it and you don't like it I mean maybe although granted like recapitulation uh, I've I probably taught recapitulation to I want to say 150 people directly I probably told in my life 150 people how to do it the number of those 150 people that actually did it is zero. Nobody. They some have done it for a few weeks. They did it maybe for a month, and then they just gave. No one, no one that I've ever worked with completed. It. In fact, out of my whole life now, there's only one other person I know that has completed their entire life recapitulation. And so I've also learned that even if you have something good to share, the chances that somebody else will do it is rare. So it's good to. It's good to be available um, to share your experience and share your suggestions, but it's always this idea of, I don't know what's good for somebody else. Only you know what's good for you. And the only way that's the only way you can find out what's good for you is to test a whole lot of stuff and see what works. But you've got to, you've got to do stuff. You can't, you can't intellectualize your way out of the matrix. You can't think your way out of the matrix. You can't, you can't read books and get yourself out of the matrix. It requires a combination of going within, deep introspection on yourself, deep introspection on knowing who and what this thing right here is and what its what its existence is, and then actual practice, actual things that you do in the course of the day that is designed to either increase the inner understanding or to move you one step further on the totality of understanding the matrix itself. Um, thinking and reading and that kind of thing, watching videos or whatever else that has, that's useful as, as, ga as information gathering, but that's not actually going to create any sort of preparation for going anywhere. It's not an intellectual process. It's a, I, I think as you said, it's an understanding process and that's completely different. Understanding or knowledge or totality is completely different than, than thought. And so you, People have to move to the next stages of whatever it is you want to move to. You actually have to do and you have to go within. That's really well said. So, and also, just the fact that uh, a lot of people would just listen to what other people have to say and not actually think for themselves. And I mean, if you're going to do that, how are you going to think for yourself when the Matrix presents something to you? If, if you're not even doing it now, how are you going to actually do it when you leave this place? And yeah. like, if you follow my guide, you know, you create your own realm or whatever, you sit there and 
you don't have stimuli because nothing is allowed to affect you and you don't have a you know habit of taking the charge yourself then how are you going to deal with that uh, empty realm basically you, you might just uh, <laughs> start seeking outside help you know and at that point you might get trapped into another matrix again so you need to really build up the right mentality right right that's a good one too as soon as you start thinking you need help you're already giving up your own authority or or rejecting your own power right that's another thing rejecting the the, the power with, we have tremendous power within we tend to it's not that we don't use it we reject it we actually don't even we don't work on connecting with the actual power that we have so same thing the more you the more someone is is looking for that inner power and attempting to attempting to make it make it rise make it make it uh, active um like you say then then there's a more likelihood when you're in a completely confusing situation in in, in an after death experience your natural tendency will be to trust your own inner power um in some ways i think that's what the korean monk i spent a lot of time with 25 years ago or so was was doing with us he was he was working on getting us to our inner power, but getting us to our inner power by having to see the giant walls we built off individually to block ourselves from it. And he was pushing against those walls really, really hard. And of course, we felt he was um, how we say, picking on us or he was, you know, but looking back he was he was attempting to he because he he couldn't break the wall down for us he just had to show what what the wall was we had to break down and if we broke it down ourselves this great power would be would be behind it and he hinted he would hint to that constantly but of course we were all we were all pretty stupid we were all never fully understanding what he was doing or why he was doing it or the level he was he was working towards and it's only been in the yeah 20 years since rethinking of the conversations rethinking the experiences i start to see more and more of what he was probably trying to do with each of us sometimes you learn more with less what he was doing with you what he was doing with someone else because it's easy to see another person sometimes more clearly than ourselves and i could see oh yeah of course he was doing this with this guy and he was working this way and and then it helps you understand more of what you're doing with yourself and and that's a big part of it if we if we recognize that we have this power within then it's just a matter of removing the wall we've put up to it. We don't, we don't have to do anything more than just what's the wall I've built to not, to not be accessing my own power, take the wall down. And that will be, that'll, that'll help you in the material. It'll help you in the, in the non-material It'll help you at every, every stage of the journey. It's, it's that, it's that uh, true divine spark within that is our, is our, um, true future right yeah. that, that also goes hand in hand with what we talked about lucid dreaming and astral projection to prepare to basically be lucid and everything when we die uh, i think a lot of the different methods people use to achieve astral and lucidity on dreaming is basically just a reflection from them having mental blocks so for example uh, i use the wiggle wiggle method as i call it to initiate my okay. first astral projection which is basically you mentally imagine yourself rolling around on your bed, like side to side, basically. And, you know, other people use the rope method. There, there's a bunch of different ways to do it. And I think oh. those things are basically just to unlock the blockage that we have in our minds that, like, limits us from mm -hmm. actually doing it. So if we just uh, recognize that we're not limited in that kind of way, I bet that we could actually just initiate those kind of things on will. Kind of like what you were talking about, just leaving the matrix, you know, like, yeah, uh, spontaneous uh, combustion. Like, I think that most yeah. of these things are just mental blocks which you put on yourself. Yeah, uh, in, in some way, we know there's certain chains that come, you might say, from the Demiurge, from the Archons, the, the structure itself that is their doing. And there's others that, in a sense, I don't want to say we've done it to ourselves specifically, they've created the scenario it's like it's like they created the trap and we kind of just then we and then we just walked into it you know we we with some ignorance just walked into the trap and then started creating the chains right we started creating our own chains. so step one is before we can get off the the bigger ones 
we start taking off the ones that we put on for ourselves. We start taking off the the things we've built in our own psyche, in our own way of experiencing this place. And um, it certainly uh, it certainly can be done. And I, now is a really good time to do it. The the crazier the world gets. And for anyone who thinks the last three years have been crazy, it's, 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 this is a warm up. It's what's coming is, you know, it's just going to, this realm is, this realm is in a, in a, in a mess and it's going to become a much bigger mess. But in the mess is the opportunity to drop so much. There are so many lies, so much false that can be seen through. And some people who have nothing to do with what we're talking about, just, just on very simplistic levels, are seeing through so many lies, so much false right now, so quickly. Um, it's actually difficult for them because they're dropping so many lies and they don't have anyone there to help them uh, help them understand what they've just what they're seeing, what the realizations are that they're getting. Um, so it's another thing to be available, even though we talked about how, how individual the journey it is, it is good to be available um, in your own way, in your own life, when people that do start dropping a whole bunch of false, all of a sudden they, they see through a number more of lies of just the material reality themselves, um, just having someone there who can help them, you know, yeah, I know about that, that happened to me five years ago, and it's like this, and you know, it's okay, don't uh, take some time to yourself, and you know, be prepared. There's more to go. Don't do it all at once. And so we, it's also, it's also helpful, but it's recognizing that it can happen quickly now. And that's just not for others. It's for ourself. Uh, I've known, I've, there's a few people that I've known over the last two or three years now that they did in about three or four months, what would normally take people three or four years, the speed at which, at which also right now you can kind of get out of the quicksand is is incredible and so the time and effort you put in to this work now is definitely not wasted because it's like it's magnified by 10 what it used to be 20 or 30 years ago because of the situation because of the circumstances because of like time being and, and space being almost squeezed in that's yeah, something i'm noticing it's like there's like a feeling that we have like we're being like an accordion you know the accordion is getting squeezed in a bit and um but that also means again great great power of movement if we use it if you just get stuck in even seeing through something even seeing through another lie somehow on whatever level whatever realm you see through it if you just get paralyzed by it it didn't really help much you have to be able to take it digest it integrate it move on yeah well said it's um I kind of wanted to mention as well with the idea of, uh, you know, with the, the cave symbolism and everything. I think a lot of the deception as well is not only the false beliefs that we have from this life, which can limit us with like what I mentioned with the astral projection, but also basically like inserted ego patterns that is basically just uh, from our bodies or from our childhoods and everything like that. I think those things can actually keep us back quite a lot. It's um, I made a joke about this on my Discord channel, where it's like, um, so after you exit the Matrix, are you still gonna be attracted to women? It's like, or is that just a Matrix uh, thing? So it's um, even just on like small levels, it, like what is actually you and what is just the Matrix, you know, pretending to be you, and being able to like discern those things and use your own logic, you know, and whatnot instead of just doing what your ego impulses tell you to do is very important so that we're not guided by the wrong forces yeah someone who likes chocolate cake and that's still their whole focus they all they want is oh great another chocolate cake well what's going to happen here when you die and they, they put a chocolate cake in front of you you know same thing right it's this <laughs> idea of but am i really who or what that it's that big who or what am i right um Am I really? Uh, am I really a person? Am I really a thought pattern? Am I really a series of emotions? Am I really feelings? Am I really? Am I really the thing that you know, likes chocolate cake? When I had my death experience in 2005 in the canyon, and I realized then had the realization that everything I'd ever thought of as me was false, was was just not true. That's all of it: thoughts, feelings, emotions, experiences. Um, everything that's everything that had ever in a sense happened to me 
in my material existence was not me. The only thing that I could even at that time say was me was the <clears throat> awareness of what was going on. The, the, the see, and everything else was just gone. Like, it's not that it was there. It was literally, it was just, it would, it had just disappeared. It had literally just vanished. It was like, it was the realization that all of those things are just etheric wisps in, in the, in the sky. So when, when you have that experience and come out of it, uh, don't physically die and continue on with living in the material realm, knowing that every emotion that you have is not actually you. It's just an emotion. It's an emotion that is being put in this box of, of me. So even when you have that understanding all of those things can still totally overwhelm you you know like it can totally overwhelm you like um uh, i'll give you a really good example though of, of, of sometimes i ramble hope you don't mind sometimes i just kind of go on tangents but no nah, i just back, want you to speak freely the more you speak the yeah, better you know yeah back 20 years ago the big thing, of course, was you didn't see people like this back then. Everybody was, they traveled around and they, they you know, the, the guru, the great teacher was on a stage somewhere and people would go and see them for a few days and then they'd move on. And I had a couple of people who were enamored by a particular guru, like literally just, just blown over. This is the greatest person in the world. And I, I was trying to explain to them, you know, it's very easy to look wonderful and peaceful and happy when you're on a stage for like two hours just sitting there and everybody's giving them a lot of money and praise. I said, if you really want to find out about this person, get on a plane, go and actually live with them for like two months. Go and find out what happens when their sister calls and 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 has a problem with their parents. Find out what happens when their neighbor dumps some trash over the, over the fence onto their yard. Find out if you want to know what what someone is really like you have to see them in all situations not just the situation they want to present themselves it's like people for example who see me for example they see me through my youtube channel as an example okay they see and i don't want to say i'm like a scripted actor when i'm here but it's a particular it's a particular um it's a particular you know profile a particular thing that i'm presenting to the public this is not how i am the rest of the day you know the rest of my 24-hour day is not like this it's different and people don't see the various stages that a person goes through the, like you know it's what that's uh you know the jesus story that um and nobody in his hometown nobody in his hometown could believe that he was a healer or was anything special because they remember him as the dumb carpenter's kid who kept throwing their ball against the wall and had to keep telling him to shut up and stop doing that and, and so it's the same thing it's it's, it's a reminder that wherever you're going to get information or who you're listening to, you're just seeing a small package of the person. You're not getting, you're not seeing the totality of them in the course of a day. And it's a reminder of yourself. Even when you're looking in the mirror and watching your experience, you're only seeing your experience on a 24 hour period in material reality at this particular time the potential and the variety of things you have that you could be doing, could be saying, could be experiencing is vast. So it's a reminder that even just like me, that I learned in that death experience, I had the, 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 the package that I was seeing every day is a very, very small piece of the possibility of what could be this thing in the material reality. And it's a reminder for yourself too, that just as much as we don't want to take a piece of somebody outside of ourselves and extrapolate to that's the way they are all the time, it's the same with yourself. You can be completely different. And again, that's another great activity, which is called, um, which is called um, acting for the sake of acting, not doing, which is purposely choosing to act in ways that is not normal. Purposely choosing to put yourself into actions and experiences opposite the way you normally do things, because it's testing your version of yourself. It's testing your the mental egoic structure of what happens if you do something completely different? What's going to happen to you? How are you going to experience? What's what's life going to experience? And um, this is also an important part to me of opening up possibility. And again, it's not all about it's not about this realm. It's using this realm as a as a tool because uh, I think 
if we're going to be in that after death state, we want to have as much freedom as possible to bring forth whatever version of ourself is required in that moment. That's what I want to say, to bring forth whatever version, even in a non-physical form, what's the version of ourself that that moment is going to require us to be? We've learned to be free in our regular life, in our material life, how to bring up different personality, personality, that's the word. Do you can just bring up different personalities as required in the situation? Why do you have to be the same personality all the time? Different ones. That's in a certain situation in the afterlife, we might need this, and then we need this one, and then we need this one. And we're using all the possible facets of the jewel that is ourself to navigate the symbolic pathway to the end result we want, which is home, right? Well said. It's um, I had a conversation uh, on this, which uh, I brought, uh, brought up uh, on my uh, second casual conversation video that I did, which is basically like, um, if you say that a 12 year old had a car accident and died, and then he starts remembering 90 years or uh, 90 years of a lifetime of being an evil soldier then like is his personality currently the 12 year old or is it the 90 year old and then you imagine that you've lived a thousand lifetimes and you start remembering all those lifetimes what is your actual spirit personality so to speak and that kind of like spirit personality might not have the same uh, wishes or you know likes or whatnot you know that you currently have mm -hmm. so being able to remember you know what you should be doing intellectually rather than just whatever ego form you're currently taking on is a very good thing to consider because what you're doing right now might not be anything near what your true self as a spirit might want to do and also the possibility that uh, once you actualize your true self uh, there's a chance that you know being in a matrix might not seem as bad as it seems right now other things might be more interesting to you than you know what it is right now so being able to remember what your current perspective is right now is probably quite important as well it's um it, for all we know we might be you know eternal beings that you know existed forever basically and as such a being being stuck for a million years in a matrix might be a nothing burger at all so because of that possibility, it's very important that we don't screw ourselves over by our different personality trait that we might adopt at some point. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, again, it's back to uh, that adage, right? Know yourself and, and people people don't understand the, the level that that small little phrase, know yourself, is really is really taking in. Everything you just said yeah, is part of that it's knowing your potential potentiality on so many different levels and knowing that the you you've come to know yourself uh, come to know as being in this realm is a tiny tiny piece of possibility and um, doesn't have to be doesn't have to be taken on doesn't have to be continued if you don't feel it's valuable and useful to finishing finishing what you need to finish um, again I, I i mean we're probably very similar that we're 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 kind of done with material reality we're not interested in being a part of this anymore and we're ready to go home so for us and for some people listening now that that becomes the that becomes the uh, what's that's the phrase i'm looking for that becomes our our number one direction in life our number one thing that we're, we're piecing together what we need to know it doesn't mean there's millions of things we could piece together but once you get to once you get to this point a whole lot of stuff just gets dropped as it's not important anymore it used to be important but it's not and um and so that means making really good decisions on i think this may have value and i think this may not and um so again it's good to listen to a lot of people it's good to take in a lot of different ideas like you kind of say, you think don't don't necessarily accept what others say, but take it in as possibility, contemplate it, and then find a way to put it in practice. Find a way to use it or test it in your own experience. That will start to let you know whether it's something to hold or whether it is to drop. If it's just an intellectual idea, it'll burn out really really quick. If it's an actual piece of information that's usable, 
you will find a way to start using it and you'll find a way to, and I don't mean transform, make yourself better or whatever. You don't need to do, necessarily do that. You just need to be able to see yourself more clearly. To, to, will it take you to knowing yourself on a much more deeper level? Yeah, well said. It's, um, I, um, I kind of wanted to ask you, um, on a different topic, what, um, what your current perspective on life scripts are. Uh, fair question. I mean, I, I know I talked about it a lot in the past because I really felt like, I really felt like they were, they were really written into us. Now I'm, now I'm kind of like on a 50, 50 page on it. I do believe that life scripts exist. I do believe that there are multiple potential life scripts that any one of us in a particular incarnation could have. You know, I might have uh, a thousand potential life scripts running through my existence right now. And I'm, you choose one over the other 999. Um, but I also don't think they're, they're like, they're like a, they're like a folder, like a movie script. I don't think it's like there's literally uh, January 14, January 15, January 16. I don't think it's like that. I think it's, it's, it's a direction points, it's experiences, it's certain connections um, those are the things that are in the life script. And then there's more like, a, I would think of it more like a magnetic force that if you're not fully aware of what you're doing, just, and you're on that record groove, it'll push you sort of automatically to that point. That's a part of the life script. And then you can meander, me, but eventually it'll take you to the next one. And, and, if, but, but of course we can jump to a different groove. We can jump to a different life script. We're still on a life script, but now we're on a different one and it'll still be. So I, I kind of feel it has some sort of magnetic pull, but I wouldn't say like the life script, like I'm drinking green tea right now. I don't think there's a life script that says uh, whatever this is, February, you know, 5th, whatever. I'm drinking green tea at 626 my time. I don't think that's in the life script, but certain things that might be going on in my life would be trying to magnetically pull me to a particular end. That's why the, the movie, The Adjustment Bureau, is really really valid for people to watch because that's what the movie's about it's about life scripts and again the mistake that that's matt damon i think right the, movie. Yeah. the mistake matt damon makes is he chooses one life script over another life script as if oh it's so wonderful the chairman the demiurge has this, said it's okay i can have this particular life with this particular girl isn't that wonderful and again it's but you've just chosen a life script that's you don't know where that's come from it's not really your own complete free choice if it's a complete free choice the free choice would be 10 billion life scripts right not a limited number that's given to us what do you think about life scripts so um i think the main reason of a life script is a permission slip as i like to call it uh, when we analyze the NE stores and everything it uh, appears that basically they need consent in order to do anything to us so basically the per the real purpose of the life script is basically to be able to affect us in other ways that isn't standard matrix routines so i think the matrix runs on two like baselines basically so you have the standard auto routines if you go to the park you'll see some old lady sitting at a bench you could sit down with the old lady make friends with her you know and start you know hanging out or something and then you have the life script uh, aspect to it which is uh uh, you might have a life script that says that at age 13 you get hit by a car, you get disabled, and now you're a cripple for the rest of your life. Now, the Matrix could wait for a random car to hit you, and just by chance, if you don't look when you're across the road or something. Or it could have a life script to do it, but it's not able to rig the game to make sure that you do get hit, unless you have a life script to it. So basically, I think that the life scripts work as consent forms for what the Matrix is allowed to do to us other than, you know, just the base routines which you agree to just by coming here, you know, like having to eat and everything. So I think that's probably the, uh, the real reason that we have life scripts. And, you know, there's probably a bunch of different clauses, you know, if this, then that, and so on, to make sure that they can actually do what they want to do to us. Mm. But I, on top of that, I don't think that it can actually control us. I think that's just the stuff that the Matrix can do against us. So, for example, if I wanted to, I could walk into the forest right now and just sit there until I started it. And like, what the what is the matrix gonna do against that? Like nothing, you know. 
So what if that's a life script? Yeah, it, it could be, you know, but like I, I could, you know, go well, off. No, I'm just saying, I mean, that, or, that's you know, how whatever. that's so challenging the subject gets because we think you think, oh, I'm not like someone, I'm not in a time loop because I eat an orange and I never eat an orange. But in the time loop, it was put in place that you'd eat the orange at this particular time to prove you're not in a time loop. You know, it's like it's so <laughs> the, the logic can easily go out the window. Sorry, I just had to throw that in. No, I, I agree with that. It's uh knowing if you're on a live script is you know a very complicated matter i think a good indication that you are on a live script is for example uh so one of my previous jobs was uh you know it just it fell onto my lap basically just when i needed it that's like okay and then i you know got a license for a specific pro profession you know it's like okay well that's obviously a live script you know like yeah, the routine is running so like there are indication that the, you know this is a scripted event it's kind of what i like to say that uh, if uh, you do not have a live script to get a specific job and you apply to that job there's 300 other applicants that all apply for that job so you have one in mm. 300 chance of being employed basically but if you have a live script then you know you have a hundred percent chance of getting employed so I think there are some indications that we are in a live script that you can notice throughout your life if things seems to be flowing way too well, basically. Also, like if things just mm -hmm. appear whenever needed, you know, it's like yeah, when someone has an accident, they're not supposed to die yet. And then a random doctor appears, you know, to help them out. Like you have stories like that. And it's like, is that doctor even mm -hmm. real? You know, like, like, did he spawn in like an NPC character, you know, just to help you so you don't die? It's uh. I mean, I had a bike accident where I went full speed, you know, down the hill without the helmet. And then I flew off my bike and I slid across the road and had a couple of scratches. And realistically, I should have broken bones, maybe cracked my skull or something. But I guess I'm supposed to live longer. And so I walk out, you know, just fine. Right. That's one thing that I got from, oh, I don't remember where the book was. But it was this idea that, and it, it plays into the life script. But if the life script, for example, had had somebody, you know, giving a lecture <clears throat> at a particular university on Monday, they couldn't get into a car accident on Saturday and go to the hospital because they have to give the lecture on Monday. So that certain things can't happen in order to facilitate pieces of the life script to occur. And so bizarrely, if somebody could have the kind of foresight to know what's in their life script, to know like in two weeks, this is going to happen, then literally they would know in order for that to occur, there's a whole lot of other things then that, that can't happen. But literally like this can't happen, this can't happen, this can't happen. And the navigation becomes smoother. Now that doesn't mean I'm, I'm, saying to accept a life script either because you know the life script is something like you say it's something external it's some sort of almost like a contract that got put in uh, in, in some you know pre-birth realm that we were that's a type of deception in itself it's a it's a obviously it's some sort of deceptive uh, agreement but until we know how to break all of those life scripts how to break all of those agreements completely it can also help. I mean, it can help a great deal if we could know for sure, hey, in two weeks, this is going to happen. So it gives me a good indication of what could or could not occur. And it, it would explain a lot if you knew, like you say, if you had these uh, this accident and, and nothing happened and you couldn't get hurt, was there interestingly something two or three weeks later that you had to do and had to be physically fit in order to do? And that's why the accident wasn't allowed to injure you. There's so many layers to when you think about this as to what things mean or what they don't mean, right? And it's it's great to have these kind of conversations and get people to think because most people would never ask a question like that. And it doesn't mean either of us are correct necessarily. It just is a it's a valuable thinking tool for everyone out there to contemplate this idea on deeper and deeper and deeper levels. Yeah, I have also heard um, people say that, you know, it might be in our scripts to learn about the soul trap which I very much doubt that it is because that doesn't seem to be beneficial for the matrix creator. So that seems like a free will, you know, like you've chosen to basically seek out the information. It's, um, it's similar to the old saying, you know, where 
when the student is ready, you know, the information appears or the teacher appears, I think it is. It's, um, I don't think they can actually control your free will. So it's uh, they can manipulate things. If you try and order a plane ticket, they could say that the plane ticket, you know, is canceled or whatever. It's, uh, you know, no more flight today or something. Yeah. So the bus gets late because you try to do something, you know, th there's a lot of rigged things that they can do. But kind of like in the um, Truman show, it's like, yeah, if, if he truly wanted to make it out of here, you know, there'd be nothing yeah. we could do to stop him. Right. But there would be so many layers of deception. There's no question that you would say this, this subject of being trapped in a, in a, in a matrix, there will be, there will have to be then. And especially now we've noticed in the last three years or so, there's been a huge movement of people discussing this, talking about it, being interested in it, wanting to know about it. There's no question then that there would have to be from the system side itself, a whole lot of false things being put out there in order to confuse people. Um, you know, if this was 30 or 40 years ago, the system wouldn't have to do much because there's there was like one or two books on the subject and that was like it. The average person was never going to come up, uh, bump into this themselves. And if somebody did figure this out for themselves, they probably just kept it to themselves and went on with their day. Right. Um, but now, um, now this could easily be a whole lot of misdirection as well being placed out there. So it does, it does, it does, you know, <laughs> I, I, Everyone is always, oh, is this person doing this? Oh, is this person who work for this organization? Or It's good to ask those questions. Don't take it too seriously. It's just more to just recognize information you see coming out. Just ask questions about it. Get to know it. One of the things I learned as a historian, I, I, a lot of the stuff I learned in university was useless. You know, of course, <laughs> uh, totally. Anyway. One of the small bits of value that I did get was they had always that we were told that don't start reading a book to do research historically until you first research the author. Find out who the author is. Find out what their story is. Find out why they were writing a book. What time in their life were they writing a book? What was their political and religious and all sorts of ideas about themselves? You had to get to know the writer before you could look into the book and start understanding what it was they were writing because, of course, they're going to write everything on a particular angle based on them. No one is ever going to write, for example, a book or present something that is totally uh, a, a it's totally objective. You know, there'll always be beliefs and, and ideas and concepts that are placed in it. So we get to know first who wrote this, who put this together. Now we can see what they've, they've written and understand, okay, what might be clear, clean information? What might be information that's coming from belief systems? What are informations that's coming from their old traumas, their old whatevers? And we can begin to sort out what's useful and what's not useful it's one of the that is one of the most valuable things i ever got from my my uh my university career was first who wrote the book before i even ever start reading it because then i've already got an angle of what is what yeah what is the angle the book is probably going to be presenting based on the person who wrote it and it should be the same thing with who are you who are you listening to with videos who are where are you going for documentaries who's putting the who's putting this information out not because it's bad not because it might be trying to deceive you it's just it's just natural two people will find the same information and present it very differently based on their own experience their own past their own feelings their own everything the more you know as well the person presenting it the better you understand what is being presented and what's of value to you yeah I mean, a lot of uh, information presented is, you know, filtered through the perspective of the person giving it. And sometimes, you know, you could even have deceptive people who try to make you believe things based on what their, you know, wishes or whatever is. So I think that can be a quite a good way to, you know, go about things to make sure that you get the right uh, viewpoint whenever you read mm -hmm. someone's work. So uh, it, yeah. it also gives you an understanding on a deeper level, because if you understand where they're coming from, you're going to be able to analyze the information they're giving to you in a better way. So it's uh, like, yeah, if you watch my videos and you don't understand what kind of person I am, you're not going to get as much from it, you know, as if you've spoken to me, because then you're going to understand it in a better and deeper way. Yeah, I think that's hopefully one thing people are doing if you're watching somebody's videos for a long period of time is also 
trying to get a sense of there's obviously say you're watching somebody's videos on a weekly basis so there's something you like about the what they're what they're sharing with you hopefully you're starting to get a sense of the person presenting it too you're starting to learn a little bit about them and the more you learn them and some of their story and you can feel out some of their background some of the life they've lived then it makes it then it makes what they present even deeper because now in a sense you're you know it's totally different if you're sitting across the table from someone you've known your whole life and they're telling you a story that happened in their day you know exactly their over their thinking patterns their what they're probably going to do what they probably said what they you know as opposed to someone you've only just met a week ago and it's the same thing with the information we're receiving the more we begin to uh, understand who's on the who's on the pre presentation side the smoother it gets for for us um, I know that th this was a big part of how the Native Indians I spent time with the Native medicine men um, we when I went to see Bruce when I started seeing him at his sweat lodges um, he pretty much didn't talk to me for a month maybe month and a half he acknowledged me he acknowledged that I was there he he made it he made me feel comfortable that I was there it was you know he in a sense he let me know it was fine to be there but he never talked to me he never asked me anything he didn't wonder how I was doing he didn't want to know anything about me like zero nothing and uh, it was maybe only a month and a half later, after he kind of been almost putting together a book about me, who is this guy? Why is he coming to my sweat lodges? What is his what is his point here? And I know some of it would have been done by him watching me, watching how I interact with others, watch the conversations I'm having, whatever he's getting from um, the, the spirit world, whatever you call that in sweat lodges. And eventually, once he began to kind of put a book together about me, he started to know, okay, here's who this person is. Here's the kind of converse. And so all of a sudden conversations began to happen. And then after a couple of months, then it was, okay, it's time for you to start tending the fire and you're going to be in charge of the rocks now. And, and slowly you got more and more responsibility. And it took again, maybe another three or four or five months before there would even be some more detailed personal instruction, things about that are directed to, like, to me personally about my life. So it was, it was this period of time where there was this, him getting to know me and in my own way I'm kind of getting to know him I'm getting to know more of how he does things how he talks to the other people who he was talking to what's he sharing what kind of information is it? and so you're building this knowledge up which then when when actual information starts to be shared with you they are ready to know what to present to you and you are ready to know what to receive it's something I find so difficult to be honest and that is when I'm making the video whenever I make a video is that I know I'm talking to like, you know, maybe 10,000 people. And it's very hard to say things where 10,000 people who are in 10,000 different places, who are in almost going 10,000 different directions, are hearing one sentence that are, that's coming out of me and could be taken a lot of different ways. And I know it's very, you know, it, it's like, I wish I could talk to each person individually because I would say something a little bit different once I got to know them. And I feel it's a bit challenging sometimes where when I make a video and I post it out and then I notice some comments of people saying, oh, you said this in the video and that means I'm like, well, no, it's not actually what it means, but that's how you're seeing it and taking it. If I knew you personally, I would probably have said it a bit differently, but I don't. And that's one, so that's one thing I really like about the old way of, meeting people and you're spending time with them and you're getting to know them and then the conversation becomes very personal and that's that's something we've lost in our digital online lockdown world <clears throat> is this more and more time just being spent with people getting to know people intimately and getting to know the the kinds of the kind of conversation we can really have with different people on certain levels where we can share more than we normally share and we can hear more than we normally share and again that's why i suggest if possible on subjects like this escaping the matrix and learning your true self and finding truth and if there's possibly somebody that you can find online okay that's great to have conversations with but even better if you can possibly find someone that you can meet with and talk to in your own experience daily, that has great value being able to share 
directly in this reality together. Yeah, I think uh, being able to meet someone uh, like in real life and not just online would be a quite a cool thing to do. It's uh, yeah, I find that the Matrix tends to place people kind of like sparingly across the planet. It's uh, I mean, if you check out my Discord, you know, it's uh, it kind of looks like we're all over the world. It's like we're evenly spaced out, kind of like the Matrix doesn't want us to get together, you know. <laughs> Uh, it seems rigged you know there should at least be someone close to each other so you know <laughs> yeah it's it's again it's more again it's a little more challenging because of how we live it would be different if we did was different like i say it was so different 20 years ago when you had all these lectures going through and there were all of these uh, nights going on and the you know the certain that the spiritual bookstore would have uh, people coming in to share their book and so there was the chance to meet. I met a number of people in those kinds of situations. In fact, the person that I had the death experience with, that's how I met. We met at one of these uh, events and we just happened to be sitting next to each other. We talked a little bit together during the thing. Then we went and had a coffee and then we started just spending time together. And we, we also, we also don't have these little events anymore within this kind of subject matter. You might say where, you can actually just bump into somebody. You know, you can't just walk into the grocery store and say, "Hey, do you have you heard about the soul trap?" Yeah, what the hell are you talking about? You know, <laughs> so you can't just walk up to people at random. But at least if you were, if you were all listening to the the talk of somebody who just wrote some book on some subject, you have an opportunity in the same room to interact with them. So I don't know if there are, and I'm just throwing out suggestions for people if you're interested in stuff like this. It's like, okay, if there are others who are interested in these kinds of ideas, where would they be? If they're if they're in your city, where what kind of things would they would they be attending or doing? Is there ways you can possibly attend that yourself? And then you might just by chance bump into them. Um, I don't know. Just throwing a suggestion out because, like you just said, if you can find someone in your life that you can talk to on a daily basis, it's a great gift. It's a great gift. Oh yeah, uh, I would have loved, you know, to have someone in uh, <laughs> close to me that I could do that with. It's um, yeah. I mean, the only soul trap or even intellectual discussions that I've ever had is just online, because there's nobody in yeah. my, you know, matrix life, so to speak, that are on that kind of level. So, yeah, it's um. Uh, it, it's a huge difference from being able to, you know, shake someone's hand, you know, like give them a hug or, you yeah. know, a fist bump or something. Yeah. Yeah. And just yeah. And also just to when you're them. going through your challenges with it, because, of course, going through this material is challenging. It's difficult at times. And it's also nice that somebody that you can look across the table from and knows knows what you're going through. You know, they understand the challenge because they they're going through it or have gone through it themselves. And there's a sense of it eases the burden a little bit of, the, of some of the challenge. And even though this is, you know, it's helpful in a way when you, like you say, it's, it's, it's just different when you've got someone face to face in front of you. And again, we, we lose this by no longer living in villages anymore, by no longer living in small tribes and clans and where we are dependent on each other for our survival, where our, our interaction as a group is important. We we lose this, we lose this um, possibilities of over time starting to get to know. <clears throat> this is this is my friend of who I can talk to. Like we have, we had a bit of that, of course, when we were in school. Maybe you're on a sports team for a while, or, but as we move into adulthood, we tend to disengage more and more and more the way we live now from the rest of the world. We tend to fragment ourselves into very small little. Uh, family units and we we kind of only see our family units if we work you go to work but you don't really only just talk about work and then you quickly get home and get away from your work it's it's different if we were living in a in a Cheyenne village those 200 people in the village we would have known every moment of our life since the moment we were born and we would have we would all have such knowledge of each other that if we had a question about anything we would know who to go ask and who to who to who to share with it and of course a Cheyenne village would have had a, a medicine person would have had a, 
would have had a shaman there. So once you get to these questions, we could have at least gone and asked the shaman. And if the medicine person kind of said, this is beyond me, you might have to go on a journey for to find out what you need, then well, we know what we need to do. Um, that, that's another interesting topic. And I'll just bring this up and maybe we're getting close to the end because I can feel my throat starting to get sore. <laughs> um, is I'm sure you know about the famous uh, pilgrim path uh, the most famous one to Campiago de Santiago, Campiago de Campostello de Santiago in Spain, this long <clears throat> pil uh, pilgrimage journey. And there's journeys all over the place. There's one here in Norway where I live that goes to Nidaros Chapel in Chon Trondheim. There's a number of these pilgrimage place, uh, uh, things all over the world. Um, maybe for people on this particular path, going on a pilgrimage even if it's even if it's only for a week or two like even just a seven day pilgrimage and even if it's just from a start point to an end point that could be maybe that's something that could be valuable for for people to just have some time or i, I know it could be a friend has a cabin or you have the ability to rent a cabin go rent a cabin for seven days and just be by yourself with you know no screens no television no internet no nothing just maybe one particular book at most that you have and a, and a journal and a notebook and just spend your time in silence spend your time in nature spend your time sitting by the lake spend your time contemplating away from all the normal things of reality and something like that could be very valuable for people to just get this break point from the way society is always pressuring us to be pressuring us pressuring and taking our time and since we have trouble living in a way anymore where it's it's built into our day we have to build in times of our life to just give ourselves total space give ourselves alone time and okay somebody says i'm a single mom i've got two young kids i mean i can't just go to a i can't take a week away and go to a lake by myself yeah i i know it's very very difficult various life situations so if you have a situation like that is there a way that you can put in, find for five days, an hour a day, that you're able to literally disengage for one hour a day for five days in a row, let's say, so that you at least do give yourself a tiny bit of space for just you. I think a lot of people forget that, that it's important to take that you yourself are important. Yes, it's important to be with other people. It's important to help others. It's important to be of value to others. Uh, hopefully that's what my books and things have done a bit of value to you but we also have to remember to take time for us that we are also important that individually our own journey is important and we have to take time where we shut out the rest of the world and say i'm not rejecting people or even rejecting things i'm making time for myself and that i think is an important part of the of the puzzle is to make sure we have that we we you know, how are you going to learn to trust yourself and how are you going to learn to listen to yourself and how are you going to learn to find your own power if you can't even every once in a while allow the material world to just say, get away from me. I'm taking time for me. I'm going to go in the forest now for five or six hours and leave me alone. Um, just that, I think, is a starting point to gaining our own totality, which is giving ourselves the space we need away from away from everything in the material and away from our requirements away from needs away from conversation away from everything and just it's it's my time now it's time for me and even if it's an hour a day once in a while it's valuable yeah that's really well said i think also the fact that you're able to understand yourself just as you can understand someone else if you're speaking with them like what you mentioned and having the understanding <laughs> yeah. of what your own mindset you know and thought patterns are so that you can understand yourself better and guide yourself in what you're actually gonna, you know, develop into. I think that's a really good thing to consider as well. Yeah. So yeah, this uh, this was a really good conversation, man. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks for doing I, it. I appreciate. It. Thanks for yeah, and and there's there's you can say I, I mean I've watched some of your videos. There's lots of very good stuff you're you're presenting and and very very important questions and concepts that you're you're presenting and bringing up. I know people who've seen some of my videos, there's lots of subjects I've never talked about in videos before because um, somebody hasn't asked that subject or that topic. So um, yeah, keep, keep doing what you're doing. It's very, very valuable to 
bring up ideas that aren't normally talked about, to bring up questions for people that aren't normally questioned because there's there's the, the one level and then there's the depth. And, you know, uh, eventually your channel, I'm sure, will grow and you're going to start getting some bigger numbers, but it's also good to have that depth because the ones that are coming then, you know, are ones that are going that are going deeper and deeper and deeper into the work. So thanks for thanks for suggesting this and having us together to have a conversation. Yeah, this was great. Um, uh, thank you, by the way. <laughs> um, do you want to like uh, promote yourself or something, you know, before we end it? Uh, I don't have to too much. I mean, uh, I would hope people have probably bumped into me by now at this point, but uh, my YouTube channel is under my name, my name, Howdy McCoskey Talks, and you can see that Exit the Cave um, if you're interested in that book, which I, I hope has some value. If you're on a journey of uh, exiting the matrix, um, you can find information on my website, egyptian-wisdom-revealed.com, and that can either take you to Amazon pages for more information. There's PDF files there. I know it's um, we're all challenged financially at times now, and so a PDF file can be the best way to go to to get something. And uh, it's um, I just, of course, an author is always appreciative of someone who supports their work. And um, yeah, that's uh, that's where you can go to see more about me. All right, great. Then yeah, if there's nothing else, I guess we'll call it there. Thanks, my friend, for having this set up and uh yeah let's see where things go and what the comments are and where where that takes us going from here yeah sounds good <laughs> i'll see you later then thanks my friend